We're glad that you're here this morning. Let me encourage you to take a Bible, if you will, and open it with me to Psalm 95. Right in the middle of your Bibles, Psalm 95, where we want to read the first seven verses to frame everything that we're talking about today. We're glad that you're here. We're encouraged by your presence. And we want to focus on God and on His will for our lives this morning. Psalm 95 helps us to do that. The very first verse of that psalm says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. A few years ago, my family went down to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. If you've ever been there, you know that there are all kinds of attractions, especially for little kids. One evening, we went over to Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's kind of like a family fun house full of odd and hard to believe things, everything from shrunken heads to world records as far as the length of hair and describing the length of different long distance accomplishments and things like that. It's kind of a living Guinness Book of World Records for the odd kind of thing. And I remember there was a long hallway. There were lots of exhibits that we had walked through. And then there was this long hallway. It was kind of dark. And on the left side of the hallway, there wasn't anything at all other than fabric on the wall. On the right side, the entire length of this hallway was nothing but mirrors from floor to ceiling. And they weren't just regular mirrors. Some of them were typical mirrors. Some of them were uh, the kind of mirrors that make you look very short and very round. Some of them made you look very thin and very tall. Some of them made you look like a wave and, and everything in between. And so, of course, naturally, as people walk down this hallway and they look into that mirror, they stop and they begin making funny faces kind of like this guy behind me. And, and uh, you're just spending plenty of time walking down through here and laughing at what you look like. What you don't realize while you're doing that is the hallway eventually ends and it turns to the right and immediately starts coming back this way and on that side is two-way glass. And so everybody on that side sees you making faces like this behind me, only you don't realize it until you have rounded that bend. All you can see is yourself. I'd encourage you this morning to look at worship as one of those mirrors. A lot of times we use worship just as a one-way mirror. And all that we see is ourselves. We see what I enjoy, what builds me up, what keeps my attention, what attracts me and, and makes me want to come back. I, I see myself, and if I were in charge, I would certainly do things differently. If I were the one making these judgments, or if I was the one fashioning the whole thing, I, I would construct it and, and spend this time in, in a completely different way. 
And there are plenty of religious organizations all over this city and all over this world who use worship like that. They'll use worship as a mirror where they're looking at themselves and then maybe turning the mirror and looking at the people around us in the community. And as I look in that mirror and shine it in their face, what's going to get their attention? What will make them want to come and and be a part of our group? What will attract them and and keep them? What will enamor them and and make them enjoy themselves and make their their children most comfortable? And and then I'll turn the mirror back and I'll look at me and now how am I going to take all of the things that I want and, and gel them with that? Maybe we've got to have two completely different kinds of services one for old people who like traditional things and one for young people who like contemporary things because we keep using this mirror and tilting it different ways and we keep seeing different ideas and opinions and wants and, and felt needs. Could I encourage you to recognize this morning that God doesn't view worship like that? That while we're looking through a or in a a one-way mirror and looking at nothing but our reflection, God is encouraging us to use opportunities like this as a two-way mirror. So maybe we get just very slight hints of ourselves, but most of all we see through these things, through the singing through prayers, through looking into His Word, through the Lord's Supper, and ultimately we see Him. That's the goal. That, that's why we're here this morning. This memorial that we're going to observe in 25 minutes or so, it is designed by God so that we would see through that and we would see Him. And, and singing... The beautiful singing that we've had together this morning is designed, we're commanded to do that by God so that we might see through that and and see Him and see what heaven is really going to be like. The problem is when I look at worship just as a one-way mirror and I see nothing but my own reflection, I, I, I see a God, I hear of a God who wants to draw near and have a relationship with me, but I try to make Him like me and He's not like me. God is not like me. God is not to be judged by my standards of justice and fairness, and power, and mercy, and and, and fleeting human opinions, and everything that encompasses all of that. In fact, God is utterly different from me. We just have a very quick primer of that all over the Bible. I am created. He is creator. He is the one who said in the beginning... Let all of these things come into being. I have a beginning. He is eternal. Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I am completely dependent. Regardless of how I I convince myself otherwise, even the air that I'm breathing this morning, I'm dependent singularly on Him, whereas He is self-existent. Paul stands before pagans in Athens and says, the God who made the world and everything in it being the Lord of heaven and earth, He does not live in temples made by man, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I am limited in space and in time. I can't be in more than one place at one time. He is everywhere. He asks, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? I am exceedingly limited in my power. And the strongest among us are limited. But God is all mighty. 
It is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. I am limited in my knowledge. He is all-knowing. He asks Job, do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? As we sing, Lord, we come before Thee now. As we sing, Oh, worship the King. Let's remember, God is not simply a bigger, better version of us. He is different. More different than a candle is different from the sun. He is more than different. The difference between a, a raindrop and the ocean or a snowflake and the polar ice caps or this room and the universe. He's more different from us than that. You turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 6. You know the word over and over and over again used of Him to impress upon us the reality of that difference, it is the word holy. There is no word that captures His difference more in an all-encompassing, all-sweeping, universal way than that. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Isaiah gives us this glimpse of a heavenly vision wherein he saw these angelic beings. And in verse 3, one said to another, Holy, holy, holy. Completely distinct. Qualitatively different in all of the best and perfect ways. That's Him. The whole earth is full of His glory. And listen to me this morning. This is how this relates to me. And it relates to you. He expects to be treated as holy in His worship. You see how different He is from all of us. And He expects us to treat Him like that when we worship. In Leviticus chapter 10, there were two young men who lost sight of that. They had heard what God wanted and they did something completely different and they are struck dead. And Moses talks with their father Aaron and says, Do you remember, this is what the Lord said. The Holy Lord, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. I will be treated as holy. That is what eternity around the throne of God will be all about. Praising Him, reveling in His perfect holiness for all of eternity. We're instructed to serve as a prelude of that, as a light in the darkness of this world while we are here. David in 1 Chronicles 16 encouraged people, ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Toward the end of our Bibles, we want to tie this in to this short study that we have been engaged in the last two weeks as to why we exist, why we're here, why this local church exists. And one of the undoubtable answers to that question is the idea of worship. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the Word of God. We exist for the Word of God. And now we see that the Word of God leads us to the worship of God. The Word of God leads us to the worship of God. But what is the aim of all of this? What is the aim of biblical worship? And we've got two T words here. You see in your bulletin, the outline, we've got two major sections. Section number one, first T word, we exist that God would be glorified through transfixed worshipers. That is the aim of biblical worship. That God would be glorified through 
transfixed worshipers. It's a word that simply means to be engrossed by something. You walk in and your spouse is fixated on preseason football. You know what that looks like, don't you? Someone is so fascinated, so engrossed, so captivated, so enthralled by what they see that everything else around them seems to fade away. You're in the kitchen working and, and, and your little daughter is tugging on your husband's pant leg saying, Daddy, 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 Daddy. See, I know what that sounds like. If you don't know what that sounds like, let me know. You can come to our house sometime this week. And, and you're, you're so transfixed that it's like you can't even hear what else is going on. That is first aim of biblical worship that God would be glorified that, that I wouldn't be just transfixed on anything that I choose but that I would be so transfixed on Him He is glorified through transfixed worshipers that word in Old Latin the language that Romans of Paul and Jesus' day would speak that word literally means to pierce through transfix through fix, pierce, to pierce through. Worship is to be God-initiated. If I am going to be transfixed the way God wants me to be, it needs to be initiated by God. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, As He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. That's what we mean by being initiated by God. There is an aim here. There is a, a focus here. He is holy and He is initiating me to be holy. For He says, you shall be holy for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, speaking of Christ and what Jesus, the Son of God, has done for us. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Who serves whom? Who serves God? This holy priesthood of a holy God offers spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Listen to me very carefully this morning. Dave hinted at it as he was focusing our minds for what we were about to do. Doesn't it make sense if I am worshiping Him that I would allow Him to initiate me in ways that will lead me to worship acceptably to Him. This is not a one-way mirror. This is not about what I want. This is not about how I would engineer things. This is about seeing through these elements and beholding Him and His glory. And when we look at it that way, naturally what happens? We offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Him. In just a few minutes, we're going to focus our minds on the sacrifice of His Son. Paul recounts in 1 Corinthians 11, that night when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and He took unleavened bread and He told His disciples, you do this in remembrance of Me. That's what worship is about. Not in enjoyment of you. Enjoyment comes from that in immeasurably precious ways when my heart is where it ought to be. Not in attraction of others. You do this in remembrance of me. Biblical worship, transfixed worship is God initiated. We turn in our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you will. Biblical worship is God-directed. It is God-initiated. He calls me to be holy as He is holy, and then He directs me in the ways He would have me to go. This makes sense. It is the very beginning of the Lord's church. 
Acts chapter 2. We look past in this place all of the, the different religious histories and traditions and customs and creeds and councils and conferences of men. And we just want to be a church of the New Testament here at Laurel Canyon. And so what do we do? We go all the way back to the original. All the way back to what is actually God-breathed. And what do we find those people who have just been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins? What do we find them doing? In Acts 2 and verse 42, they devoted themselves. They're so transfixed that they devote themselves to what the apostles tell them to do. Biblical worship is God directed. You have your Bibles open there to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I don't have, or I should say 2 Timothy chapter 4, excuse me. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, I don't have that on the screen behind me. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Paul says to young Timothy, I'm charging you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing and His kingdom. What do you preach, Timothy? You preach the Word. Why? Because biblical worship is God-directed. Paul tells saints in the city of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Worship of God that is acceptable to God is God initiated and it's God directed. Don't get drunk with wine. That is, is debauchery. It's foolish wastefulness. Be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we did here. I, I love the sounds of pianos and horns and stringed instruments. Absolutely, if, if, if you come in this building during the week, odds are if I'm in the office, I'm, I'm listening to some kind of classical music. I love the sound of classical music. But God didn't tell me to look in a one-way mirror and, and figure out what I want to offer Him. God encourages me to look through what he has said and behold him. And he says, you address one another. A trumpet can't do that. But the human heart can. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with what? With your heart. You see, what, what we did at the outset of our time together, that, that wasn't just traditional. That, that's just not what we've always done here. It's biblical. And we do that because worship is God-initiated and God-directed. We turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Worship finally under this heading is to be God-centered. The very idea of worship, awfully close to our English word, worth. And that's not an accident. Worship shows the worth of someone. And when my worship is God-centered, this is the, the, the kind of heart that it flows out of. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Let us therefore be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship. Acceptable to whom? He's the only one under consideration here. I'm going to offer what's acceptable to Him. How do I know? He's told me. And He's living and active. Word. Let's offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. But it's different from what everybody else is doing. Why are we surprised? We began with He is completely and totally different. Distinct. Created versus creator. Beginning versus eternal. Dependent versus self-existent. Limited versus everywhere. And all-powerful. Limited in knowledge. All-knowing. Perfect. And so, of course, it will be different. The worship that He tells us to offer in comparison to those who are simply using this as a one-way mirror. Biblical worship is God-initiated and God-directed and God-centered. Chapter 13 of Hebrews and verse 12. Look at 
Look to Jesus and what He suffered for you. Verse 13, Therefore let us go to Him outside the camp. He is our focus. He is our aim. Go to Him. Bear the reproach He endured. For we have here no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through Him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Biblical worship is God-initiated, God-directed, God-centered. Let's go back in our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We said there were two T words. First is transfixed. The goal of biblical worship is that God would be glorified through transfixed worshipers. But goal number two is that God would be glorified through transformed worshipers. Listen to me very carefully this morning. We're glad you're here. And we're glad that you are transfixed and focused on what is happening here. But if you leave here not being transformed... Biblical worship has not been brought to completion. You've got one part, but you haven't added the other part to make it a whole. If I sing with all of my heart, and then I go out this week and I use my mouth in profane ways, biblical worship has not accomplished in my life what God intends it to accomplish. If I bow my head and I pray to God and then I go home and I treat my spouse or my children like dirt, biblical worship has not accomplished what God designed it to accomplish. But if I am transfixed here so that I am pushed and motivated to be transformed out there, biblical worship has done exactly what it was designed to. First Timothy chapter 1. Biblical worship, through worship, we are to be oriented by God. And, and you understand what that means? To orient something just means to, to adjust in relation to. You buy a new mirror and your wife says, we've got to reorient this whole living room because of the new mirror. We're going to reorient everything in relation to this new mirror or some of you will be going to a college campus and you will be oriented you will go through orientation we're going to adjust you in relation to what you can expect on this campus or if we're building and we want the building to face north we orient the foundation so we make sure what we're building faces the right way to orient just means to adjust in relation to something that's the goal of biblical worship through worship, worshipers are oriented by God. First Timothy 2 and verse 1. I urge the Spirit of God through Paul says that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people. Pray when you come together. Pray individually. Pray for everybody. Those in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. God lead. You see that? We're transfixed by God and now we go out and we are godly. How does that happen? We've oriented our lives in relation to God. We've emptied everything and we rebuild it in relation to God. Dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Dave mentioned it in our announcements. The Son of God says... God is spirit. He's different from you. You orient your worship according to the spiritual living God. You worship Him in spirit and in truth. You take the truth and you allow the truth to direct you into what is acceptable. But you also worship in spirit. Listen to me this morning. It's wonderful to worship and to work with a local church who is worshiping according to the form of the New Testament. But just because I sit in an assembly where the form is correct doesn't mean that my worship is correct. If it is not in spirit, if my heart 
my soul is not engaged, if my attitude is ungodly. Through worship, we are oriented by God. Through worship, we are renewed by God. Ephesians 4. Put off the old self. We leave this place having been transfixed by God and now we lead lives of transformation. Put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Listen to me. You will become like what most transfixes you. If you are most transfixed by football, that will come to dominate everything. That will be what you think about and meditate upon. If you become transfixed by shopping, that that will dominate your thinking and, and come to be what you fill your spare time with. If you become transfixed by a person, that person will become a God in your life. But you are transfixed by God and you allow all of these other good gifts to be constructed and oriented around Him, and you will grow to be like God. Worship, in worship, we are renewed by God. And finally, in Romans chapter 12, through worship, we are commissioned by God. Our theme verse for the entire year from Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. We come together and we sing about the mercy of God. And we worship through reading and studying about the mercy of God. And we pray, we thank God for His mercy and we ask Him for continued mercy. And we have a living reminder of the greatest mercy ever shown. That's the first T, transfixed. Now, by the mercies of God, having been transfixed, you go and be transformed. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Take your song books out, if you will. Turn them to number 150. I appreciate the songs that that Paul led this morning. Appreciate him letting me point him in this direction with his selections. I want you to think about what we sung before. It was all about being transfixed. We sang... Lord, we come before Thee now. We sing, O worship the King. And now we want to sing, Purer in heart, O God. That's the goal of, Lord, we come before Thee now. It's the goal of, O worship the King. It is that we would be moved to sing and to pray, Purer in heart, O God. Help me to be. As we memorialize the death of Christ we're going to sing when I survey the wondrous cross transfixed when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my greatest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride I am transfixed and I am transformed think about that as we sing these songs Live the words of Jesus this week from Matthew 4. Be gone. This one who would take my focus off of God. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. This morning, if you know, you need to come to Him. You need to be forgiven by Him. We've reflected on this pathway all year so far. It begins with discerning God's will for my life. 
and adopting God's way of thinking as my own and, and out with the old, the sinful, and in with the new and engaging the world, living for Christ every day, everywhere. But if you are not His this morning, if you've never come to Him, here's where it begins. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. There were real life people who heard what they needed to do. Heard the call of Acts 2. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Heard Romans 6, 3 and 4. Do you not know that those of us who have been baptized into Christ have been buried with Him in His death in order that we might be raised to walk in newness of life? Having been set free from sin then, you've become slaves of righteousness. Are you still in your sin? Have you wandered back into sin? Think about the transforming words of this song. And if we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come to the front while we stand and sing.